I invite Honorable Justice Dr. A. K. Jayashankaran Nambiar, Executive Chairman, Indian Law Institute and President, Board of Governors, Kerala Judicial Academy, to deliver the introductory address. Chief Guest of the Day, Gautam Bhatia, Advocate of the Supreme Court. Moderators of today's function, Advocate Jacob, J., uh, Jacob P. Alex and Advocate Ramola Nainapalli. My esteemed colleagues on the bench, former judges of this court, Advocate General Sri Gopalakrishna Group, Shaji, other law officers of the state, judicial officers from the district judiciary, Yashwan Shinai, the president of the Kerala High Court Advocates Association. Um, I didn't see Anoop here, but other office bearers of the executive committee of the association, senior advocates, Simati Shantama, president of the Kerala Federation of Women Lawyers, members of the legal fraternity, registrars and other officers of this court, uh, Sri Sujit, director of the Kerala Judicial Academy, students from the various law colleges, advocate clerks, ladies and gentlemen. Late last year, the ILI and the KJ, the Judicial Academy, decided to kickstart this series of lectures and discussions on legal issues of contemporary relevance. This is the second such event and the first in this year. Today's discussion will focus on the recent judgment of the constitutional bench of the Supreme Court upholding the power of the President of India to abrogate Article 370 of the Constitution that accorded a special status to Jammu and Kashmir and its residents. What are the implications of this judgment as far as the, our constitutional text is concerned? What, are the, what does it do to our understanding of constitutionalism in our country? Are we to see this as an aspect of transformative constitutionalism? Well, who better to answer all these queries and to help us decode the Article 370 judgment than Gautam here, who wrote a treatise on our constitution calling it the transformative constitution. I would see this if, for those of you who have not read the book, very unlikely that there are many who have not read the book, but for those who have not read it, please, I would seriously commend it for a serious reading. Gautam graduated from National Law School of India University in 2011 and later studied at the Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship. And in 2014, he completed his LLM in Constitutional Law from Yale University. He is now practicing before the Supreme Court. On behalf of the Kerala Judicial Academy and the Indian Law Institute, I welcome you, Gautam, to our midst. And I'd also venture to describe Gautam as a role model for aspiring legal minds. The moderators for today's session, Advocate Jacob P. Alex and Advocate Ramola, these are our homegrown our homegrown talent uh, and they will be guiding us through a spirited exchange of ideas and opinions, ensuring that our discussion remains focused and intellectually stimulating. On behalf of the Kerala Judicial Academy and the Indian Law Institute, I also welcome you both to this discussion. I welcome all my esteemed colleagues on the bench, the former judges of this court, Advocate General Gopal Krishna Kurup and other law officers of the state, judicial officers from the district judiciary, Yashwan Chennai, president of the Kerala High Court Advocate Association, other office bearers of the executive committee, senior advocates, Srimati Shantama, president of the Kerala Federation of Women Lawyers, members of the legal fraternity, registrars, other officers of this court, court reporters of live law and bar and bench, students from the various law colleges, and all other distinguished persons present here. Let's all look forward to a great and cerebral discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I invite Advocate Gauri Balakopal to introduce the Chief Guest, Sri Gautam Bhatia, Advocate, Supreme Court of India, and the moderators of the session to the August gathering. I have been bestowed with the pleasant duty to introduce the speakers for the day. 
It is my distinct honor to stand before you today to introduce a luminary in the realms of law and literature. Shri Gautam Bhatia, an eminent lawyer, constitutional law scholar, and an accomplished science fiction writer, has carved out a niche for himself in the Indian legal landscape. He embodies a unique blend of intellectual acumen and creative expression. Mr. Bhatia's profound understanding of constitutional law has not only distinguished him, but has positioned him as a trusted authority whose research is sought after by senior lawyers and esteemed scholars. Gautam Bhatia graduated from the National Law School of India University, Bangalore in 2011 and thereafter went on to pursue Bachelor of Civil Laws and MPhil degrees at the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He pursued his LLM from the Yale Law School specializing in constitutional law. During his time at Oxford, his essays and articles on jurisprudence and political theory was published in leading international law journals and publications. Sri Bhatia had served as a law clerk with Justice Ravindra Bhatt before starting his practice as a lawyer in 2014. He was a pivotal member of the legal teams involved in various landmark cases including the right to privacy judgment, the Aadhaar constitutionality challenge and the challenge to section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. Most recently, he was also part of the legal team involved in the highly sensitive case challenging the abrogation of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, which is the focal point of our discussion today. His work has been cited by the Honorable Supreme Court on four distinct occasions, adding yet another feather to his already vibrant cap. Sri Bhatia has also marked his presence in the realm of legal literature and has published books titled Offend, Shock or Disturb, which is an authoritative work on free speech, The Transformative Constitution, A Radical Biography in Nine Acts, and The Unsealed Covers, A Decade of the Constitution, the Courts and the State. His latest book, published a few months back, titled Horizontal Rights and Institutional Approach, provides a new conceptual model for considering constitutional rights from a comparative perspective. Sri Bhatia has also co-authored a book titled On Citizenship along with Romila Thapar, N. Ram and Gautam Patel. Sri Bhatia also regularly writes on Indian constitutional issues on his blog Indian Constitutional Law and Philosophy and is also a visiting professor for constitutional law in India's top law schools. Beyond the legal sphere, Sri Bhatia has also ventured into the imaginative world of science fiction through his debut novel titled The Wall, followed by its sequel, The Horizon, both of which featured on Locus Magazine's recommended reading list in 2021 and 2022. The Wall was a finalist for the 2021 Valley of Words Best Language Novel Prize. Bhatia was long listed for the astounding award for Best New Writer at both the 2021 and 2022 World Science Fiction Convention. As we delve into the exceptional accomplishments of Gautam Bhatia, it is evident that we stand in the presence of a remarkable individual whose intellect knows no bounds. Next, we have our moderators for the day, Advocate Dr. Jacob P. Alex and Advocate Ramola Nainpalli, who are familiar faces for us. Dr. Jacob P. Alex obtained his LLB from the School of Indian Legal Thought, Mahatma Gandhi University, and completed his LLM from the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, and took his doctorate from the Verhampur University, Odisha. Before starting his practice as an advocate, he served as a law clerk and research assistant to Honorable Sri Justice S. Rajendra Babu, the former Chief Justice of India from 2002 to 2004. Recognizing his expertise, the Kerala High Court has appointed him as amicus curiae in several cases so as to provide effective assistance to the court. His report titled Disaster Management Towards a Legal Framework was jointly published by the United Nations Development Programme and the Indian Institute of Public Administration. In addition, he has also conducted extensive research and has prepared reports pertaining to law reforms on various issues for the National Judicial Academy, Ministry of Law and Justice, United Nations Development Programme, and the Kerala Legal Services Authority, to name a few. Advocate Ramola Nainpalli is an alumnus of the National Law School of India University, Bangalore. She worked as an associate lawyer with Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas Mumbai from 2014 to 2016 before joining the firm Messrs. Menon and Pai and starting her practice here. In fact, she was three years junior to Gautam Bhatia in the National Law School of India University. 
Without further ado, let us start the conversation. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. So the scheme of our conversation, we are planning initially since the regiment on Article 370 is a very voluminous regiment. We thought of giving you an introduction about the background of Kashmir issue, Supreme Court judgment. Then we will have the conversation, we are planning to concentrate the conversation on three broad issues. After that, Ramola will conclude the conversation by about within half an hour or so, I mean 45 minutes. After that, uh, we will have an open session where we are free to ask any questions to Gautam, he will answer it. So this is a scheme. So let me give you a very brief introduction about the background of the Kashmir issue. Kashmir was originally a princely state. Between 1925 and 1947, Maharaja Harising was a ruler. In, on 18th July 1947, British Parliament passed Indian Independence Act of 1947, wherein section 1 1 say that from August 15, 1947 onwards, the British Empire would be divided into two dominions, that is Dominion of India and Dominion of Pakistan. And by August 15, 1947, the sovereignty of British monarch will lapse and it will revert to the rulers of 562 princely states. And these states were given an option either to join India or the Dominion or Pakistan or to stay as an independent nation. As per Section 6 of the Indian Independence Act, whoever want to join India will have to execute an instrument of accession. And that instrument of accession essentially provides for three subjects, that is external affairs, communication and defense. As on 1947, August 15th, three states, that is Junagadh, Hyderabad and Jammu and Kashmir, decided not to join either India or Pakistan and they remained independent. Therefore, they did not ex execute any dom the instrument of accession. But within two months, by October 26th, Kashmir faced serious external threat. Then at that point of time, on 26th October 1947, the Maharaja decided to execute instrument of accession with India. And he executed so. Wherein there is a very interesting provision, paragraph 7 it says that the clause 7 of IOA specifically reserve right of the state of Jammu and Kashmir to enter into agreement with the government of India under any future constitution. So, meanwhile, the Constituent Assembly was debating about uh, on the constitution of India, framing of the constitution of India. And there an issue comes about giving special status to Kashmir. And article, draft article 306A was framed. And this framing of draft article which gives special provision to uh, Jammu and Kashmir is having a background. Because at that point of time war was going on inside Jammu and Kashmir. Then the issue of uh, Kashmir was pending before the United Nations and thirdly, the legislature or constituent assembly for Kashmir could not be established and unlike part three states, Kashmir, the ruler of Kashmir did not execute a revised instrument of accession which many other states including Kerala are all executed. So in this background, the draft constitution approves that to give a special status to Jammu and Kashmir. Then, by January 26, 1950, our constitution was adopted with Article 370, which is titled as a temporary provision. There are two important aspects of Article 370. Article 370, first say, Article 238 will not apply. Now, Article 238 is it's deleted. Now, second, the power of Indian Parliament 
to make laws for the state of Jammu and Kashmir is dependent on the concurrence or approval of the uh, uh, government of Kashmir. And thirdly, articles, Article 1 and Article 370 was made applicable. Now, Article 1 say India, that is Bharat, will be a union of states. So other than these two articles, other provisions, especially the uh, list items, will be made applicable to Kashmir only if it is approved by the government of the Jammu and Kashmir. Now, Article 370 is having a very interesting clause, Clause 3, which say that, which permits the President of India to declare that the article ceases to operate, but upon recommendation of the Constituent Assembly of the Jammu and Kashmir. Then, Jammu and Kashmir, by the time November 1956, framed their own constitution. And the preamble of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution, which is given in the paper, given to you, it's safe. It is further to define the existing relationship of the state with the Union of India as an integral part thereof. The conspicuously, there is no provision, there is no declaration that Jammu and Kashmir will be a sovereign state. Now, coming back to the present political situation that led to the abrogation of Article 330. On 19th June 2018, the then CM lost support and uh, she resigned. On the next day, invoking Section 92 of the Jammu and Kashmir Constitution, the state was placed under governor's rule. And Section 92 of the Jammu and Kashmir Constitution is having a unique thing because it will the, the governor's rule can continue only for a period of six months and there is no provision for extension of the governor's rule. Now, by the time that six months period was going to elapse, on 21st November 2018, invoking powers under section 53 of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution, the assembly was dissolved. Now, after that, on 19th December, exactly on completion of six months, 19th December 2018, the president of India invoking powers under Article 356 imposed President's rule in the state. And the proclamation is very important. Proclamation, two important provision. One say the President assumed all functions of the government of the state as also all the powers to be exercised by the Governor A. And B it say declared all powers of the legislature of the state were to be exercised by the parliament. This is Article 356.1b, which says that upon declaration of uh, an emergency, the president is having an option to, to empower parliament to pass legislation on behalf of the state legislature. And on the same day, the proclamation was approved by both houses of the parliament. Then, after six months, this proclamation was extended because Article 356 permits extension of presidential rule. On 5th August 1959, the Constitution application of Jammu and Kashmir Order 2019, that is called Constitution Order 272, which was challenged before the Supreme Court, was issued under Article 370 of the Constitution of India. Essentially, it superseded the original uh, Constitution Order of 1954 and all modifications which gave special uh, provisions applicable to the Jammu and Kashmir. And second, and interestingly, clause 4 to article 367 was added, wherein it say that in the original article 370, the expression, the, the constituent assembly will be substituted for legislative assembly. On the same day, parliament in its capacity as legislature of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, recommended president under article 373 that all clauses of article 370 shall cease to operate and expressed its views under article uh, to accept Jammu and Kashmir reorganization bill 2019. On the next day that is 6th of August 2019 the declaration of article 373 of the constitution was issued by the president that is called Constitutional Order 273, making all provisions of the Constitution of India applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. 
and declaring that Article 370 ceases to operate with effect from 6-8-2019. After three days, Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019 was passed, was brought into force with effect from 31-10-2019, essentially reorganizing the state of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories. One, Jammu and Kashmir with a legislature and two, the union territory of Ladakh without legislature. Thus, the state of Jammu and Kashmir was bifurcated. This issue was taken up before the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, this constitutional order 272, 273 and the Reorganization Act was challenged. The Supreme Court upheld the not unanimous, three judgments unanimous with Chief Justice and then two concurring judgments, but unanimously it upheld all the constitutional actions taken by the union government. Now, the main points, that the main law that declared by the Supreme Court, I'll just point out one, it said that state of Jammu and Kashmir does not retain any element of sovereignty Number two, it say, the petitioners did not challenge the issuance of proclamation under section 92 of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution or imposition of president's rule under 356. Then parliament under article 356 can exercise powers of legislature including law-making powers. This is a very important thing because there was the argument is this, that when parliament is exercising special powers under, during the tenure of emergency, they got a limitation to exercise those powers. Supreme Court said irrevocable decisions can be taken by the parliament during the president, during the tenure of the presidential proclamation. Then, it said Article 370 is only a temporary provision. Further said, power of president under Article 373 can be unilaterally exercised even after dissolution of a constituent assembly of Jammu and Kashmir and proviso to Article 370 cease to exist. The president under Article 373 can unilaterally issue notification that Article 370 ceases to exist. To exercise this power, concurrence or collaboration of the state government is not required. Then it said, for bifurcation of states or reducing the area of the state, Article 3 of the Constitution provides so mandates that the views of the state has to be taken. Insofar as Jammu Kashmir Constitution, there is uh, an amendment which says that it shall have to concur with the views of the state has to be taken. But then Supreme Court said, the views of the Legislative Assembly for reduction of the area of a state is only recommendatory in nature. Then, Parliament can validly exercise its power on behalf of the state legislature. Number eight, the Jammu and Kashmir Constitu uh, the Reorganization Act was challenged. But Leonard Solicitor General of India made an undertaking before the Supreme Court that the statehood in JNK will be restored. And recording that undertaking, Supreme Court did not answer that issue whether the state can be divided into union territory. At the same time, Supreme Court upheld the establishment of uh, union territory of Ladakh. This is the brief outline about the background. And this is the law of the land. Now, accepting this we'll have to discuss about the background of this judgment. Ramola may. Yes, thank you, sir. So, uh, from this introduction, I think it is uh, fairly clear that several issues were dealt with by the Supreme Court in this judgment. But to focus our discussion, uh, we've, we thought we'd just limit it to three main issues. The first is the power that can be exercised under Article 3 as far as reorganization of states are concerned. Second would be if there are any limitations on the exercise of power under Article 356 by the President as well as by the Parliament. And lastly, the unilateral powers that the President can exercise within the constitutional scheme, keeping in mind the federal structure of our nation. 
So I'll jump into the first issue uh, right away. So just, just for us to understand, of course, Jacob sir has already given us an overview, but I think it will be helpful for us to hear from Gautam what and how did the Supreme Court treat the exercise of power under Article 3, especially as far as the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act are concerned. Yeah, uh, is this audible? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks and thanks for a great summary of the, of the case. It makes life much easier uh, laying it out so, so clearly. Uh, so I think that uh, with respect to, to Article 3, the, uh, the core issue was that uh, does the, that does parliament have the power to uh, downgrade a state into a union territory or into one or more union territories. And uh, the, uh, the main argument from the petitioners was that, uh, well, two arguments. One that the text of Article 3 does deal with a range of situations with respect to breaking up a state into one or more states, uh, adding territories, altering the name of the state. But uh, even if you read state as union territory as is, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as, as Article itself says, uh, you don't find any express power to uh, downgrade from state uh, to UT. And the second argument was that there is an implied limitation uh, under Article 3 that uh, insofar as you can read Article 3 in two ways, one that allows for this part um, and one that does not allow for it, uh, you should read it in the second way because that is more consistent with the federal structure and we can go into that in a little more detail, in detail if you want to. So those were the two main arguments. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court finally did not answer uh, the question because as, as you rightly said, there was an assurance made by the Solicitor General uh, that statehood would be restored uh, in due course. So ultimately the court did not answer the question with respect to the scope of the powers under Article 3 that Parliament has for this purpose. So it, as, as Jacob sir had said, and the question was left open on what the powers are, the limits of that power. But in the same breath, um, they have upheld the creation of the Union Territory of Ladakh, which if you look from a geographical point of view, I think is more than half of yeah. the original state. Um, so even though the question has been left open, a part of what that, juris or that legislation does has been upheld without discussion. So does this in essence foreclose any kind of discussion on the validity of that power? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question and uh, I'll answer it in two ways. So first just to put the council hat back on, uh, there was no dispute between the two sides that, that, one, that, the, that the power that the parliament does have uh, includes the power to divide an existing state into another state plus a UT. And because one is that it, that flows from the text of Article 3 uh, A. So when you say that Parliament may by law form a new state by separation of territory from any state or by uniting two or more states or parts of states uh, and when you read state as, as UT as, as you are required to do, then that is very clear. So, so that was… What about clear. explanation 1? Yeah. Explanation 1 which says that state includes union territory. No, exactly. So when you read union territory as… State. part of state, then that is very clear that what parliament can do yeah. is uh, to uh, divide an existing state into st another state plus a UT. So that wasn't in dispute between the two sides. Uh, the Ladakh bit was not in dispute. Uh, and that and brings you to my second point which actually goes a little deeper in, into the issue. Uh, so the reason why that wasn't in dispute even as a matter of principle uh, takes us back to the question of why does article 3 give parliament these far reaching powers in a federal structure. Right? So uh, why does article 3 not give the state legislature a veto over its own division uh, and why is the power only of a consultation? So under article 3 if parliament wishes to alter a state boundary or add or detract from a state territory. The only requirement is consultation with the legislature. Yeah, the that state. is how we have divided yeah. many so, states. Yeah, and the, reason, the reason for that is, is interesting. Uh, and if you go back into the, uh, the, the debates, framing, the framing debates, this was actually in discussion. And the, the reason why the, uh, it was limited to consultation was because what the framers understood. No, consultation or views. Or views, yeah, yeah. yeah so what the framers understood was that 
the structure of the states that we inherited at independence were, was non-homogeneous. So states were not uniform territories. And often within a specific state, you would have further linguistic, cultural, ethnic minorities who would then want their own you know, territory, Identity. their own, their own, their own uh, autonomy. And our, our history has instances where this happened, right? And so if you gave the existing states the power to veto uh, these demands, then that would effectively mean that within the state, majorities would oppress minorities. Correct. And so parliament was given the final power on this with a consultation requirement. Uh, so the idea was to protect uh, minorities in the state and if they want their own future state within the, the union, then they can have that. So that's why the, the power of, of parliament was, was of this kind. And that's why if you are dividing a state into a state plus a UT, where you're carving out one... UT. Yeah, you're carving out the UT and then setting them on the path to eventual statehood, then that's well within the overall vision um, of, of Article 3. Uh, but that is not the same as converting a state or changing its character altogether. So that, that was the, the argument was more on that. Uh, and so that's why on the issue of Ladakh, there was no dispute. And the court, that's why there's no discussion also. I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So what, what you said about UTs eventually being state. Yes. So I, uh, the essential difference being the autonomy that probably yes. a state exercises within its territory. Now, um, you touched upon why Article 3 is as it is, probably yeah. to protect minorities within the state, but is completely disregarding or giving absolutely no effect to the views of the state in a matter where its own territory, which is integral, yeah. is, is varied. Does that subvert in any manner the federal structure of our constitution, which is also part of the basic structure? So is, is the constitution itself taking away from the federal structure by having an article in this fashion? Yeah, so I think that there are, there are two, or three, two or three answers there. So one of course is the, the constitutional structure itself and in that sense, uh, uh, as many cases have held, we are not, we are not a federation in the US style uh, where uh, you know, every state has its own constitution. Of course, JNK had it and that's another point of discussion. Uh, so where you know where state boundaries are inviolable, so that was not the choice that was made. And um, for a number of reasons that included, for example, the requirement of a national political economy at the time of independence, the need to present a uniform face of India in international affairs, and fears of secession, the constitutional structure is skewed towards uh, Central. the centre. Uh, the, the question, and, and Article 3 is one of the many uh, provisions that reflects that skew towards the centre. You have you have it in the in the fiscal provisions. You have it in the incompetence, all of that. Uh, the the three fifty six. Sorry, three fifty six. Yeah, of course, three fifty six as, well, as well, right? So, uh, but the question, is, as as you rightly said, is that then the debate then is about the limits of, of that skew, and and the real core debate in the Article three point in the in, in the Article three seventy case was that are there some limits to that power under under Article three, and the argument the petitioners made was that the powers are limited at the point at which exercising the power would undermine the federal structure. So that was of the core argument because if, if the parliament is allowed uh, to completely degrade a state to a UT, if that power exists, then conceptually the power exists for all states. And so therefore the power is, the, the power's width is one that would allow for converting all states to UTs. But Article 1 says Union of States, not Union of UTs. That was in effect the core argument uh, that that power cannot therefore be in Article 3, uh, which was not answered. That question wasn't answered. So I think just one last follow-up question on this issue. Um, as, as in the introduction it was said, this question was not gone into on the basis of an undertaking which was given by the Solicitor General. Just for us to understand, um, are these undertakings binding on governments because tomorrow the government might change? Are they bound, bound by this undertaking? And there was also a subsequent direction to conduct elections. Yeah. In this, uh, the undertaking was that statehood would be restored. Yeah. Um, there was also a direction to the election commission to conduct elections before, I think, September of yeah. this year. 
So how would, say, a citizen of uh, Jammu and Kashmir enforce such a provision? Yeah, so I think, I think on the first question, the, uh, the restoration of statehood can take place only through the repeal of the Reorganization Act, which is, of course, something Parliament has to do. And the uh, Solicitor General's un undertaking can bind the executive, uh, but not Parliament. Now, of course, in the yeah, Indian... Gautam, here, yeah. pause for a moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the abrogation of this Jammu and Kashmir Reconstitution Act, yeah. suppose the statehood is restored, the assembly can do it, no? Sorry? The assembly can do it because... No, because then the, uh, the schedule of the constitution, all of that, we have to amend that, right? So, so uh, the assembly cannot give itself uh, statehood. As of now, under the 2019 Act, the, uh, it's a UT. So, only after... It, that act goes, can the assembly do any or take any action because its okay. powers flow from that act. So mm -hmm. the assembly cannot go above the act that creates it effectively whenever the assembly is restored. Okay. Uh, so that's, that has to be by parliament uh, and the, uh, the solicitor general's undertaking can bind the executive but it can't bind parliament. So I think one unanswered question then is that, that uh, who should the undertaking have been taken from in, in this case. Now of course in the Indian system uh, we have a parliamentary system where you have a lot of fusion between the executive and, and parliament and with various uh, constitutional amendments like the 10th schedule, actually effectively in the Indian constitutional system the executive is quite dominant over parliament but still there is a formal separation. So I think that one question then is that, that can the executive's law officer actually bind parliament, I think that's something that, that is, is unanswered. Uh, and yeah, I think as far as the uh, undertaking on the elections go, so the holding goes, uh, yeah, so I think that the, the Supreme Court obviously does have the power to pass directions uh, and uh, if insofar as the election commission then say does not conduct um, elections under the time stipulated, then theoretically one should be able to file a contempt uh, you know, application against the uh, body based on the judgment, but then we have to see how that goes. So I think that, but that's still, I think, quite far, far in the future, so we have to see. Act will need to be repealed first and then it goes into elections like that? Uh, well, not necessarily because the Act itself makes provision for UT elections. So the, the time limit is only for elections. The time limit is not for restoration of statehood. Uh, so technically you can have elections for the UT's assembly. Uh, you don't have to restore statehood for that, for that to happen. Okay. Now I think we can move to 356, yeah, move to yes. See, uh, coming to 356, it's a very uh, unique power as far as a federation is concerned. The moment yeah. we say that India is a federation or a quasi federation, whatever, then you, no power similar to 356 can be found in any other constitution for that matter. Now the, the most important and uh, provision is, uh, I would say 356.1b which says the president upon declaration of uh, the presidential rule declare that the powers of the legislature of the state shall be exercisable by or under authority of the parliament because 356 route was adopted by the parliament in the instant case to validate the abrogation of 370 or whatever so how you place the whole thing in the context of 356 specifically say that if the president by proclamation declares that all powers of the legislature will automatically be exercised by the parliament and mm. per se you can't say it is unconstitutional because uh, it's not undemocratic also because people are elected mm. to the parliament by the people from the state also they are also there so why can't the parliament take a decision on behalf of the state yeah yeah yeah, so I think actually it's interesting, uh, um, the, the, the US constitution has actually a somewhat similar provision, but they never used it. Uh, there was one, once there was a rebellion way back in the 19th century, there was some talk of using it, uh, but they never used it. Um, of course, in our case, it's been used a, a lot more. Uh, so I think, I mean, so, so there were many things that were not in dispute in, in, in the case. So of course, one thing not in dispute is that under the 356 proclamation, uh, as you rightly said, Parliament steps in for the state, legislation. The state assembly. But as with the Article 3 uh, argument, I think this is what makes this case uh, particularly interesting because 
none of the arguments were basically straightforward. They were all, you know, uh, based on constitutional principle. It wasn't something that could get directly from, from the, the text. text. Uh, this was also an implied limitations argument, essentially. So, I, I'll try and break down the, the argument in simple terms. So, the argument was that, look, uh, ultimately, the uh, extent of the power you have under 356, as with all constitutional powers, must be understood in the context of the purpose of this provision. And the uh, purpose of the provision is flows from Article 356 Clause 1, uh, which is that if the President, on receipt of a report from the Governor of a state or otherwise, is satisfied that a situation has arisen in which the government of the state cannot be carried out, uh, carried on in accordance with the provisions of this constitution, then he may do X, Y, or Z. So, the idea underlying 356 is that things have broken down in a state to the extent where governance is no longer possible in accordance with the provisions of this constitution. It could be you know, internal rebellion, could be complete disorder, could be many other things. Um, and so, therefore, the national authority, the federal authority uh, must step in and take over uh, governance until such time that you can restore, restore it. Uh, the uh, compliance with the constitutional machinery. And so, therefore, the, the uh, task of the uh, parliament and the president when acting in uh, substitute, as substitutes of the state authorities is what the petitioners call restorative, which is that you restore status quo ante, how it was before uh, you had to declare a 356 proclamation. And so, therefore, it follows, and again, just to paraphrase the argument, uh, much as 356 empowers you to do some things for X purpose, it also, therefore, limits you only to accomplishing that purpose. Right? And so, if the purpose is restorative, uh, what you can't do then is make fundamental structural alterations that completely change the structure of the state itself. The irreversible right. changes cannot be made. Well, so I think the irreversible point is interesting because the code goes into that. So we can okay. we can talk a bit about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as far as irreversible point, uh, see the argument is this: once the proclamation of emergency is there, the parliament cannot make certain decision which cannot be reversed subsequently. Say, for example, that happened in state of Jammu and Kashmir. The decision to divide the state is an irreversible decision. So, such decisions cannot be taken. Now, the, the background, but Bombay case actually yeah. permits you, once you obtain approval of the parliament, you can go to that extent. That is what yeah. the law says. Yeah, so I think, I think this is a really, really interesting point and this is where you see, I think, a tension in the majority judgment of the court in 370. So, when you, you know, use the word irreversible, it, it, irreversible can mean one of two things. Uh, one is uh, a simple, say, physical irreversibility. So I, you know, I build a, a dike to stop a flood. There's a flood happening. Uh, you know, I build dikes to stop the flood, or, or I, you know, demolish some some things. So there is a kind of physical irreversibility where you know uh, you can't uh, undo something you have changed, like permanently, in that sense. So that's one kind of, of irreversibility. Uh, the other kind of irreversibility is constitutional irreversibility, right? Which is that, uh, so for example, and to take this case. Um, if you alter the status of the state. a state to a UT, now when you bring back the assembly, the, that assembly cannot reverse that reverse. because they are, they are now UT, so they are now have less powers. So basically, you have given them less powers than they had, so they can't reverse that particular change. And so that distinction between the two kinds of, of irreversibility, you know, is the, the key issue. Law there. making and non-law making powers. Well. But the kind of change you are making, right? So exercising your lawmaking powers, the kind of change you are making. And there are two things I think to, to look at, right? So, so one is uh, 357 clause 2. Uh, I think it's perhaps not here. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, uh, so, so 357 clause 2 uh, uh, says it's that… Sorry, it is not in the paper. I, I'll, I'll read it out, yeah. So yeah. It's, because it's, it's a very interesting provision and it's a, it's a history which… I think it's key to this whole understanding of 356. So, any law made in exercise of the power of the legislature of the state by parliament or president under 356 proclamation uh, shall, after the proclamation has ceased to operate, continue in force until altered or repealed or amended by a competent legislature or other authority. Right? 
So now the interesting thing is actually that before the uh, 42nd amendment, the emergency amendment, the it was different. It was automatically seized. Automatically seized after unless six months. Continued, unless continued, yeah. Uh, and uh, then it was changed by Indira Gandhi during the emergency and then the 44th amendment did not change it back. So one of those un undone uh, yeah. changes post emergency. So the, the argument then was that 357 clause 2 still presumes that when that competent le le legislature returns, it can at least in theory reverse that change if it so wants. But if it's now a UT, it can't do that, right? So it, it is unable to do that as a constitutional matter. But yeah. then the situation is different because it got stamp of approval from the parliament. Yeah, so that's exactly where the issue of implied limitations comes in, right? So does 357 and 356 place an implied limitation upon parliament to not make those kinds of changes that are fundamentally non-restorative in nature, which can't be, you know, restored. That, that was the argument. And I think here the judgment is interesting because, of course, the judgment says that uh, irreversible changes can be made. So the majority judgment says that, and that, as we have seen, that's quite correct. There's no, there's no dispute there. Uh, the judgment does not deal with this distinction between kinds of irreversibility, but what it says, following Bombay, is that there must be a nexus between the kind of change that you are making and the proclamation's purpose. Okay, so it says that. Now. In this case, it doesn't deal with that question, whether it was or, or wasn't. Um, but it then follows that if a proclamation's purpose can only be restorative under 356, because that is its purpose, it has to be, it can't be beyond that, then any power that goes beyond that doesn't have a rational nexus with the restorative goal. So, that, so then the question is that does the judgment actually then place certain limits on 356 by saying, that one, there must be a nexus between the proclamation's goal and the actions you take as parliament, and two, the court can review that under the Bombay standard. Right? Yeah. So then the question is that has the court endorsed a kind of limitation on 356 powers, yes. which we will find out next time this comes yeah, to court. Right? Maybe that is one way of looking at things. Yeah. And one more interesting, yeah. uh, somewhere I have heard, but hearing the arguments of uh, solicitor yes. that the same situation was there uh, during the formation reorganization of state of Punjab. Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was also during an emergency. Yeah. yeah. And there also this argument was yeah. raised. Yeah. yeah. So there was a high court judgment. High court judgment yeah. by Khanna. Yeah, yes. by, the, by the older Justice HR. HR, HR Khanna. Yeah. yeah, so that, that point was made and there was a, an issue, there was that issue between the two sides and uh, the petitioners argued that that was incorrectly decided, it should be overruled. Uh, and in any case, you know, uh, that wasn't applicable to, to this case. And the state uh, argued that that should be applied. And I think that finally, the, the judgment of the court, the majority, by uh, 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 saying that Bomai's, uh, Bomai's requirement, there must be a nexus between the mm. proclamation's goal but and yes. the action, effectively makes that high court judgment now sort of old law. So the standard now that we all follow is, is Bomai. And the question then is that, under that standard, is it or is it not allowed? That, that, I think that is the open question. But the general apprehension about this judgment, some people are saying, yeah. that tomorrow any state can be placed under emergency in the same fashion yeah. and as parliament can assume the role of the legislature and yeah. can give the views and then divide the state. Yeah. So this is one, one apprehension, one main criticism of the judgment. How do you take this? Because yeah, so I think I think that is is exactly the question of how you read the judgment, right? And I think that will exactly be the the future the future um, uh, legal battle will exactly be on that. So if that happens, if if say this happens in the future, at some point, uh, what the apprehension is, uh, then of course the state will argue that the Article 370 judgment by allowing for irreversible changes to be to be made sanctions this kind of an action to take place. On the other hand, those challenging it will argue that this uh, action, dividing the state, uh, can never be have a rational access to the proclamation of the 356, because the whole point of 356 is to restore to what it was. So I think that will be the, the key battle in, in the future if it happens. And I think that the interesting thing about this judgment is that, again, much like Article 3, it can be read both ways. 
Yeah. So, uh, the, another way of reading is very interesting also. That also I find a very interesting argument yeah. which says that look, there are a lot many powers in the parliament and the constitution which if you are not controlled, mm. it can create a lot of confusion. Yeah. 356, every yeah. now and then if you are yeah. going to technically saying that that power is there. Yeah. The question is whether you are going to exercise it quite frequently. Now that depends on your restraint, you are using it and this is one judgment which is very special to Kashmir situation yeah. and it may not happen in yeah. the other situation. Yeah, but I think the, the, key, the key there and I think you raise a very interesting point is that and this is the big debate between political constitutionalists and legal constitutionalists, right? So the, 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 the political constitutionalists will argue that the restraints have to come from politics, right? So, if tomorrow the uh, center wants to do this to another state, they should be concerned that doing this will, you know, lead to a political uh, backlash which will harm them, you know, uh, harm their, their, uh, you know, their governance or it will harm them in the next election. Uh, whereas the legal uh, constitutionalists would say that the court must enforce those safeguards. Uh, you know, it, it can't be left to, to politics. I think the really interesting thing is that where you have constitutional silences, much like in 356, this, yeah. Article 3, that becomes a big debate, right? So should it be something that was the idea of the framers, ultimately these silences are meant to be resolved through political back and forth, or should the court be the body that enforces those guardrails, those safeguards? Uh, that is an ongoing, you know, debate and that I think will continue yeah. on uh, in the future. Yeah. What about? I think, um, I think we'll just move on to the next. Yeah, then that's we're running time is slightly short on time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as in the introduction, we touched upon the various uh, levels of consultation, approval, etc., that's required from the state government or the state of Jammu and Kashmir in particular, while the president exercises power under Article 370. So, I think it can be a little uh, difficult or confusing for for us to understand so could you just take us through through yeah. 370 yeah and how it is that the court concluded that the president has in effect uh, unilateral power under that yeah so 370 is, is a very unique uh, provision right so that it it created this very uh, complex relationship between the uh, the union and the state of of jnk um, and so, I mean, the entire thing is a little complex, so I, you know, I, I, I won't go into the whole, uh, you know, article, but just come to Article 370, Clause 1, uh, Sub Clause D, right. So, uh, if you read it sort of, you know, from the beginning, uh, uh, notwithstanding anything in this constitution, uh, that is there. Uh, and uh, then, uh, such of the other provisions, that is, provisions not being Article 1 and 370, because those two were applicable to JNK from the beginning. Uh, such of the other provisions of this constitution shall apply in relation to that state subject to such exceptions and modifications as the president may by order specify. Uh, then go to the uh, second proviso, uh, provided further that no such order which relates to matters other than shall be referred to in the last reading proviso, which is certain matters in the instrument of accession. We do not have to go into that. Uh, shall be issued except with the concurrence of that government. So, what basically this meant was that in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, 1950, there were two constitutional articles applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. Article 1, Article 370. The rest of the Indian constitution, for it to be applied to JNK, would require a presidential order with the concurrence of the government of JNK. Now, over the years, bit by bit, many provisions of the Indian constitution, in fact, almost all were applied to JNK using this process. So, there would be a presidential order of 1954, the famous one, 65 and so on, where it would be like using this order, article, articles like 5 to 12, articles 17 to, to 25, just taking random numbers, now are applicable to JNK with a few modifications here and there. So that was how the Indian constitution would apply to JNK. Article 370 clause 3 uh, said that uh, uh, if insofar as you want to abrogate uh, 370 or abolish or alter 370 itself, uh, then the president can do that through an order provided that the recommendation of the uh, constituent assembly of the state 
would have to come, uh, would be necessary for that to happen. Now, the reason why this became controversial was that the JND Constituent Assembly sat from 1951 to 56. It uh, enacted the JNK Constitution, whose preamble is, is there uh, in, in, in this uh, document, and then it made no recommendation. So, it was supposed to at that point say, okay, now we recommend that this will be what Article 370 will look like or abolish it or whatever. They just dissolve themselves or adjourn sign die without making a recommendation. And so, the issue was that you had this, uh, uh, so 370 said that to abolish 370, you would need a recommendation from the uh, Constituent Assembly, but there was no longer a Constituent Assembly. Right? So, how do you, what do you do? That was the, the key, the key issue. No, I, I think I'll just add on to that. This is what the Supreme Court have actually addressed on this issue. Say that now to get a concurrence or recommendation of the Constituent Assembly is a near impossibility because yeah. Assembly is not there. It was, yeah. uh, you know, it was over 1956 onwards there is no Constituent yeah. Assembly. Yeah. So therefore, Supreme Court said that provision, that proviso is an impossibility yeah. and this is perhaps the only provision in the Constitution which say that it will cease to have effect upon issuance of a proclamation notification by the president. Yeah. So therefore, they just took 373 yeah. and declared that the proviso is no more relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the route that they have taken. Yeah. But uh, you had said that, you know, there are several constitutional orders that have been passed by the president um, in, in, in exercise of powers, both under 371D and now re most recently under 373. Um, obviously, the purpose of these orders is towards making the state of Jammu and Kashmir as much as any other state yeah. Yeah. in the country. Yeah. Now, the goal of the constitution at, at the time of its inception was national integration, as you yeah. mentioned at the beginning, yeah. to put out a united front yeah. and all of that. So, in this context, regardless of what has, uh, what, what led eventually to um, the, whether the proviso applies or not, yeah. is it not in national as well as administrative interest to take away the special status and make Jammu and Kashmir or integral part of India. State. Integral part of India. In integral, which does not say exercise, uh, does not have to govern itself yeah. with another constitution because every application under this would require an amendment in the Jammu and Kashmir constitution. Yeah. So, would it just not be better in national interest for this status to be taken? Yeah, so this was actually uh, the, this was the, I think the under or the unstated debate was actually this, uh, which is uh, what, what does integration mean and what is the constitutional vision with respect to, to what integration means. So, if you, if you look at the arguments made by the Attorney General, uh, you know, and the arguments made by Mr. Salve, so they argued that, look, the, the goal, the ultimate goal uh, was that uh, you would have uh, a sort of one-size-fits-all approach to federalism, where every state has a similar relationship with the center. Uh, that was the ultimate goal of 370, using this method of of uh, presidential orders with the concurrence of the government. And so therefore, uh, and effectively, and this of course everyone uh, agrees on, by 2019 it was more or less done. There was, there was, no, there was no real, well there was not, uh, there, there was uh, something still left, but a lot of it had, had now been subsumed using this method. Um, and so they argued that look, this is just the logical final step of that process. So that was the argument made by uh, the, the state, or by, by at least two, two councils on the side of the state. Uh, on the other side, the argument was, and, uh, and I think this wasn't really made, you know, expressly, so you, you wouldn't see it in the, in the oral arguments, uh, but this of the, the underlying uh, idea was that, uh, that there is this idea of asymmetric federalism, which is that uh, in a constitutionally diverse or, or plural uh, country, the, uh, you have different relationships that govern different units of the federation vis-a-vis -vis the center. So, if you look at Article 371, for example, uh, you see that in many of the northeastern states, uh, specifically uh, uh, Mizoram and Nagaland, uh, there are, uh, for example, exemptions from the application of certain laws without concurrence from the assembly of those states involving personal laws and so on. And if you look at the history of how, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, um, uh, that happened, it was through social movements, through protests, 
often through violence. So Nagaland, you know, you had long-running insurgency, and Article 371 was an attempt to contain that insurgency by extending certain kinds of asymmetrical benefits. That was the argument. It's like political compromise. Well, exactly, right. So that I think, and, and you really, I think that that that's the key. Uh, that's the key point you've made, because, and this is sort of now the an, the analyst hat, the analyst hat on, uh, taking a step back from from the case. In some uh, nation states, there is a kind of normative or or principled commitment to the idea that you must have asymmetric federalism. So, for example, Canada, Quebec, you know, linguistic, yeah, linguistically different. In Belgium, Flanders, and you know the rest of Belgium. So, in some uh, countries, there is that idea that okay, there is a principled reason uh, why we have these differential arrangements. In some countries, it's a political compromise where, as and when uh, difficulties arise, you know, you address them through these compromises. And in the Indian case, it is more historically it's been more a political compromise uh, than a principled commitment, right? I think so. And I think that actually, ultimately, if you want to understand why the judgment went the way it did, I think ultimately it's it's the fact that the the Indian Constitution, uh, in the Indian Constitution. This asymmetry has always been a political uh, compromise. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and so therefore, you know, if it is a, a compromise, it can be ended also, you know, in a similar way. A similar so way. there is there is no constitutional reason to entrench that. That is know? why, uh, without any concurrence of the parliament to abrogate this provision, yeah. the president was given the power. Yeah, which is something that would not have been possible had the court, you know, believed that there was a principled commitment to that. Uh, asymmetry and not a political one. So I think that ultimately the judgment's key lies in, in this in this, this, this yeah. matter. Yeah. What would be the alternative? Okay, if, if suppose yeah. um, the court did not hold, yeah. but in the interest of national integration, what would you suggest would be the method to achieve the same end? Same result. Yeah. If not through 373, yeah. yeah. What would be your? I, how do you think the same end could be achieved? Yeah, so I think that uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, so we had many discussions on various possibilities and I think that the, that uh, if you want to maintain fidelity to sort of the structure of 370 purely as, a, as an interpretive matter, uh, there would need to be a, a resuscitation of the Constituent Assembly of JNK, which is a, is a, a political device which would then approve, approve that to happen. That's only it's theoretical possibility. Practically, it will not. Well, well, not right now. And obviously, not right now. Yeah. But in countries across the world, you know, you've had that that happen. You know, Good Friday Agreement in, in Ireland. So, oftentimes, conflict has been brought to an end through. But our experience is different. You take yeah, any provision, yeah, it's, reservation, it's, it may not whatever, be yeah. feasible right now. Feasible so, right now. Yeah. So we'll have to mm -hmm. take some route. Now yeah. Let us move to the last question, and by the time we round up this session, then we'll go for public. Yeah. So one last question, you know. Yeah. Uh, all constitutional issues are political, yeah. including this. So when normally we find that when Supreme Court is faced uh, to, to address the issues regarding personal liberty or uh, fundamental rights or human rights, we will go for a very vast, you know, a liberal interpretation. But when it comes to interstate dispute or formation of state having some external uh, you know, uh, affairs issues, then it will take a very different stand. So, how in the broader canvas you see this political issues, mm. uh, when confronted with the Supreme Court, what is the basic approach? Because whether that is having any bearing on this judgment, that is what we want to find out. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question and this is actually what I'm working on right now as in, as in a, a book project. Uh, it's what I call the uh, centralizing drift. So, so my argument is that and, uh, that over the years, the, uh, the Supreme Court's approach to constitutional structure uh, and constitutional design is broadly a centralizing drift, which is that where there is an interpretive gap, uh, interpretive silence in the constitution, uh, the court resolves that broadly in a way that the entrenches works. the centralizing tendency in the constitution. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Bomai is one example of that, which is a partial exception to that. Uh, but broadly, that's been the trend from the first really major federal case, which was uh, State of West Bengal Union of India, the Mines case, which the court really got into the theory of it. Uh, from then to now, 
the court has has uh, broadly been of that view and i think that that uh, to deepen that point a bit it's not necessarily something that you could say okay the court is doing it but the constitution itself yes. is in a certain sense has a centralizing drift to it which you know which is there in many many provisions many many provisions uh, and there are reasons for that going back to independence no, national they, security they, they may not be reasons now but there were reasons at least back then so you know so uh, so i'd say that that would be our summit up so there is a centralizing drift in drift the court's understanding the of of constitutional structure which comes through in a case like this and in other cases yeah. with a few counter examples but mostly i think it's that ramona you can conclude the thank you sri gautam bhartia advocate dr jacob p alex and advocate ramona nainpalli for this enlightening and insightful session on the article 370 verdict i request honorable justice dr ak jayashankaran nambia to hand over mementos to the dignitaries as a token of a gratitude and appreciation the three of these people deserve a very great round of applause it was it was fantastic gautam ramolo and uh, jacob i think it was it was enjoyed by all and uh, i'm so glad that uh, many of you joined in to ask these questions because i think this is the essence of uh, any program that we have here we, we need different perspectives we need people coming up with more questions and uh, especially fatima thank you uh, <laughs> you you walk right into the lions den and and talk about uh, judicial independence and things like that good thank you sir i invite shri k n sujit districts and sessions judge and director kerala judicial academy for the concluding remarks honorable justice uh, dr a k jay singer nambiar president of the board of governors kerala judicial academy and the executive president of uh, ili other honorable judges of the court of kerala um then uh, advocate general and director general of prosecution senior advocates uh, my lawyer friends uh, officers and the law students so this evening so meaningful and so beautiful uh, gautam bhatia he graciously consented to come over for our lecture delivered it in a fantastic manner and on behalf of kerala judicial academy and in law institute i express the profound gratitude to gautam bhatia akin to that the other two moderators you know how they control the discourse so both of them really deserves great accolades and on behalf of kerala judicial academy on behalf of indian law institute i express our profound gratitude to them also <laughs> honorable judges of i uh, got of kerala in spite of very difficult task they also turned up for the function on behalf of academy and on behalf of indian law institute i express our deepest gratitude to them also <laughs> learner the duke general learner director general of prosecution other law officers of uh, i got of kerala they also turned up for this function we express our deepest gratitude to them also <laughs> the judicial officers uh, accepting our invite they also turned up they so and patient, patiently listened all the proceedings here i express our deepest gratitude to our dearest officers my dear law students some great questions it evoked some good response from you and you are the greatest beneficiaries of this evening this event we hope to uh, conduct similar kind of programs because the response the enthusiasm eagerness which you had shown and exhibited here which is thought provoking to us also and the way in which you uh, dared to ask the questions to our uh, respected dignitary it re uh, really re deserves a kudos to you and you all turned up on behalf of the academy on behalf of indian law institute i express our deepest gratitude to you also all other officials all other officials of the kerala judicial academy volunteers of indian law institute other person who had extended all sorts of help to us we express our deepest gratitude to you also 
thank you thank you all for participating this event we have come to the end of this enlightening ceremony kindly rise for the national anthem jan gan man adhinayak jay he bharat bhagya vidhata punjab sindh gujarat maratha dravid utkal vanga vindhya himachal yamuna ganga चल जल तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे